Hi everyone, welcome back to the Lumbermill devlog. I've worked on quite a range of areas in the game since last time, from simulating the forest life cycle and animating pixel art trees, to programming one of the most highly requested machines. For those new here, Lumbermill is a factory builder and management game I'm building solo in Unity 2D. After adding steam power and letters in the last episode of the devlog, this time around I shifted my focus to calculating market values for items in the game. In Lumbermill, items can have a range of properties, each affecting the item's value. The solution to that was to add a value modifier to each of the possible properties. Modifiers can add or subtract a specific amount, including multiples, or set an item's base log value. For example, here a raw spruce log with no extra properties will have a value of 100 amber. Any other properties the item has will add or subtract from that base value. In order to check that would all work, I also added a line of text to the UI for inspecting items on conveyor belts. Thankfully this was all fairly straightforward to implement and I got that working without any major issues. Hovering over items with the ID tool enabled will show the market value for that item. This value affects trade deals and the amount of amber you get when putting items through the amber press machine. Next up was the forest life cycle. Up until now trees would grow but never die off and new saplings would never germinate. Both of these are vital to ensuring the game remains balanced, so I started by basing tree death on the same code that controls tree aging. When a tree has lived in the final ancient growth stage for a certain period of time, it will die off. To test that, I used a speed of 50, which was pretty high just to check everything worked. Here the red trees are dead. With that working, I set dead trees to despawn. That also worked, and you can see that the forest disappears over the course of a few runs of the algorithm. With ancient trees dying off, I also needed to make sure tree saplings would spawn. The rules for this are essentially a cellular automaton, with potential sites for saplings being empty and having two or more adult neighbours. This just makes sure that saplings emerge on the fringes of the forest, rather than in wide open space. At first I got suitable locations to output as text to the console just to check everything was working before actually planting the trees in the forest. At first there seemed to be a lot more trees than there should be until the older trees started to die off. That's not really ideal and I'd like the number of trees to stay mostly constant. I decided the best way to check this was to get the game to output the number of trees in the forest in CSV format, essentially just numbers separated by commas. I let the simulation run at very high speed for 3 minutes before copying the output and generating a graph from it in Excel. This charts the number of trees in the forest over time, and you can see a really steep rise and then fall early on. This definitely isn't ideal and I needed some ways to counteract that. The main things I opted for were to firstly cap the tree count at the number of trees on the island when it's initially generated. I also made sure the tree count isn't affected by trees planted by the player. The graph looked like this once those measures were implemented. In gameplay I'm very happy with the balance this provides, and it does its job well of ensuring the distribution of trees stays mostly the same as long as the player isn't aggressively deforesting. I took a break from the code stuff at that point to create new animations for spruce and maple tree saplings. A long time ago, before I redesigned the trees, there was an animation for pine trees when planting new saplings. Based on that, I created a new version for the current spruce tree design. I imported that to Unity, replacing the old animation, and this was the result in the game. Next, I created an animation for maple trees. Each species in the game will have its own sapling growth animation distinct from the others. In game, it looked like this. The next problem to solve was one that's really bugged me for a long time. Sorting 2D sprites from an isometric perspective, like in Lumbermill, is a pretty complex problem, particularly when you have items moving between grid positions, such as items on conveyor belts. Items can slip over or under conveyors unintentionally, and I've gone through a few different solutions, but none of which have fully worked. I suspect this is one of the main reasons games such as Factorio are presented top down. I think I've finally come up with a solution though that should work all the time. The first step was to remove the stilts from conveyor belts. In order for this to work, conveyor belts cannot overlap any other tiles in front or behind themselves. Next I moved conveyor belts onto their own distinct rendering layer. This means conveyor belts will always be rendered after the ground but before trees and buildings. 
The animations for conveyor belts are disabled currently, but you can see the items are now rendered correctly, on top of the conveyors, but behind trees and machines. It's a seemingly simple solution, but it's one that's taken a long time to get the specifics right. With that solved, I could write the system for selecting sprites for items. At the moment, items are displayed as placeholder white diamonds. Similar to calculating market values, item sprites depend on the properties an item has. A debark log will look different to a log with bark, for example. I created a new class for defining item sprites and created a new type of object called a sprite bank. This can be accessed from anywhere in the game and is used to store all the possible sprites and related item properties. I started by designing a basic spruce log. When I put that in the game, the sprite selection system worked, but the logs were comically large. So I went back to A-Sprite to slim down the logs until I arrived at a design I was happy with. Here, as spruce logs enter the debarker, they're stripped of their bark and their sprites are changed. This system should hopefully scale well regardless of the number of properties an item has, and it will always revert to the closest fit if there's no exact match. The final addition for this devlog is the dry kiln. This is a type of machine that's been requested quite a few times and is responsible for drying lumber to prevent it from warping. These are absolutely critical in the industry, so I wanted it to be an important machine in the game. As with all machines, it started with some placeholder art, before creating an object for it in Unity, which I could then attach the dry kiln script to. I also had to add new text to the game for the kiln, before filling out all of the relevant details in the Unity editor. Once I'd added that to the game's tech tree, so it can be researched, it was ready to be coded. Once I'd added a drying timer and an inventory, the machine took items before drying them and therefore removing the green property. The main problem here was that items left the machine stacked on top of each other, rather than one after the other. Alongside fixing that, I also added a new item property called Split, for when wood has been overdried and as the name suggests, has split. That all worked, but for some reason every item exiting the machine had the split property rather than occasional items. It turned out that the random function responsible for this was using integers when I meant to use floats. I also drew a new lock icon which will be displayed on the machine's control panel. With all that done, dry kilns work like this. The first version requires steam as a heat source and you need to manually select a species to dry. An automatic species option is hinted at in the dropdown with a tooltip indicating an upgrade is required. Once you've upgraded to version 2 or 3 in the tech tree though, the machine becomes more efficient, you no longer need to supply it with steam and logs are split less often. All of this should hopefully give the player enough options to configure kilns how they want for the products they're producing. If you'd like to be notified when the game comes out or goes on sale, remember to wishlist it on Steam. It's free, you can change your mind later, and it helps me out a lot. The link to that is in the description. Special thanks to this video go to my patrons as always. In particular, I'd like to thank Hayden, BD Smith, Mike James, Yelp1, Lego Nerd, Devon, Pepper Trollman, Kleb, Oja Marin, Dominic, and WarnerM14. That's all for this video. If you liked it, remember to subscribe, and I shall see you here next time. Thanks for watching.